our course is called uh, poetry this is a 12 week course anyone can do this course as you have seen the primary aim of this course is to introduce different forms of poetry and themes of poetry to anyone interested in poetry we also have attempted to bring in some we we have also attempted to bring in some elements of approaches to poetry particularly critical approaches so we will see as much as we can now in this introductory session live session we have uh, a question which i will answer at the end of this uh, introductory session at the appropriate time we have designed this course as a 12 week course so that we could cover different forms of poetry primarily from british literature we have also considered american literature and also indian literature only in one or two cases we have some samples from australian and canadian literature as part of our uh, feminist poetry uh, module so 12 weeks means 12 modules the introductory module would give several dimensions of poetry particularly defining poetry discussing the uses of poetry or approaching poetry and uh, different forms of poetry poetic devices uh, the music of poetry we have to understand that poetry is all about music poetry or a poem uh, was began as a song just people uh, express their wishes or desires pains joys and sorrows so poetry cannot be dissociated from song so now we have poetry which is uh, disconnected from uh, song but at the same time we have to remember that recently we have uh, uh, some groups of poets called slam poetry they recite their poems sing their poems bob dylan is a great example of a person who performs his poetry and in british literature also we have liverpool poets who made it a point that they would uh, sing their poem <coughs> sing their poems or uh, perform their poems in front of live audience so the first week in the first week we looked at different kinds of or different dimensions of poetry like this and then uh, we started with uh, chaucer's poem the canterbury tales particularly the prologue to the canterbury tales and then we moved on to elizabethan poetry in the second week here primarily we focused on sonnets we have to understand that sonnet is a major form of poetry even today people uh, who are interested in writing about their emotions they uh, use this sonnet form though they may have different um, line patterns or uh, structural patterns they may have they may not exactly follow the elizabethan i am the pentameter structure or 14 line structure some modern poets may even follow just they may have 12 lines or even tetrameter they may have and some of the major poets like wyatt sari sydney spencer uh, shakespeare drayton samuel daniel all of them dealt with the idea of love so again one more thing that we have to remember about poetry is it's all about intimate emotions of human beings what one feels for another human being in in many cases it is um, between two opposite sexes but <coughs> we can understand that um, a woman can express her love for another woman a man can express his love for another man or uh, human beings can express their love for nature or love for some divine being 
or some idea of freedom, liberty, and things like that. So we have um, a love poetry. And uh, then uh, when we come to metaphysical poetry in the third week, we find John Dan, uh, Andrew Marvel, George Herbert, Henry Vaughan. Uh, these are the major poets that we have discussed in the second week. Here also you can see uh, primarily these uh, metaphysical poets deal with love, love for um, a man, and love between a man and a woman, as in the case of John Dan and Andrew Marvel. But in the case of George Herbert and Henry Vaughan, we see that they uh, discuss their love for God or their relationship with God. It's not that John Dunn hasn't written, he has written uh, spiritual poems, especially for uh, God or about God, he has written. But what we have chosen to deal with, a poem like the canonization deals with uh, the love between a man and a woman. And there is an attempt to transform or to transport, uh, transcend this human love to a divine love, uh, to the level of um, making it canonized. Just like a saint being canonized, the lovers can also be canonized. That's how ja John Dan would approach love poetry. In the case of Andrew Marvel, we could see uh, we are all subject to uh, time. Uh, we can't live here in this world for long. So as long as we live here, let's be united and live together. That's how uh, Andrew Marvel argues in his poem to his coy mistress. That is uh, primarily from a male point of view. That's why we have given a poem by Annie Finch as a sequel to Marvel's poem. In the, in the 21st century, uh, how would a woman uh, think about the same uh, kind of proposal from a man, she simply uh, declines, refuses to accept the offer from uh, the man. And she, she says, let's live and write poems as long as we live. And uh, from there, we move on to neoclassical poetry. We have John Dryden and um, uh, Alexander Pope. In addition to that, we have some poets like um, uh, Thomas Gray and also William Collins, plus we have included um, William Blake as well here uh, so that we could accommodate him in some place. Um, in romantic poetry, we have many poets, so we thought we could have him here as at the end of neoclassical poetry to signal the transition from neoclassical poetry to romantic poetry. As you can see, uh, as you would have understood after listening to the videos and also to the uh, reading the uh, reading material, you would have understood that uh, love or nature or human beings or human society, uh, more of um, human weaknesses are seen in this neoclassical poetry. That's why in MacPlecno, John Dryden satirizes dullness or um, uh, stupid people writing poems. Uh, it's uh, more like a personal animosity or personal vendetta. Um, John Dryden writing against uh, Thomas Shadwell. And in the same in similar way, we have Alexander Pope attacking uh, Joseph Addison in the form of Atticus and um, Lord Harvey in the form of uh, Sporus. It's more of a personal attack. Even then, we can see uh, poetry at its best, neoclassical um, uh, poetry. From um, unrhymed iambic pentameter in Elizabethan poetry, that is blank verse, we move to uh, heroic couplets in neoclassical poetry. As the emotions are expressed in different ways, some kind of formal changes or change in form also occurs. The same iambic pentameter or blank verse was not found suitable by neoclassical poets like Dryden and uh, uh, Alexander Pope. So they perfected the art of uh, heroic couplets. It would be very nice of you to read some of these uh, poems and uh, see some of the rhetorical flourishes, particularly antithesis, oxymoron, paradox, irony. We have uh, irony and paradox in metaphysical poetry as well. We have the conceit, 
which also in metaphysical poetry, but when you come to neoclassical poetry, you can see the um, best form of neoclassical wit or irony and paradox. For example, when he uh, when Pope attacks um, uh, just Madison, he would say willing to wound and yet afraid to strike. Uh, a timorous foe and a suspicious friend. Uh, when it comes to Lord Harvey, he would say, without uh, hesitation, amphibious thing, neither this nor that. So that kind of personal attack, Pope would indulge in uh, neoclassical literature, particularly in his uh, satire, verse epistle. That is another kind of um, form that we have to think about in the case of Dryden's uh, MacPlecno, that is considered to be an example of mock epic. The epic we know from Homer's um, Iliad or from uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. So for, to give an example of mock, uh, uh, mock epic, we have uh, MacPlecno. And to give uh, an example of verse epistle, we have an epistle to Dr. Abednath in neoclassical poetry. Then we move on to romantic poetry and uh, Victorian poetry and all others. But in this uh, introductory uh, lecture, let me confine, uh, let me stop here. Just to, to mention the titles of the uh, modules that we have, we further we move on to romantic literature, Victorian literature, modernist literature, American poetry, uh, contemporary British poetry, feminist poetry, and Indian poetry. At last, we have a discussion with uh, <coughs> a poet. And also, we have some discussion with uh, two teachers of English who teach poetry. And we have different opinions or uh, a variety of opinions about what poetry is and what uh, uh, the poetry, uh, the teaching of poetry is. So in this way, we look at sonnets, odes, songs, epics, mock epics, um, satires, uh, dramatic monologue when it comes to Lord Tennyson and uh, uh, Robert Browning, we'll see that dramatic monologue. Then thereafter, we have more of free verse. But we have to understand that different kinds of combinations of verse forms would always be available to us. <coughs> now, <coughs> this is the... Um, so far, what we have done is to think about the objectives and also the course content. Now, we have many references in our course, and I would urge all of you to look at two primary texts or uh, references that we have. One is The Art of Poetry by Wallaski, another is uh, Poetry the Basics by Wainwright. So if you are able to get hold of these two books, you can really understand what poetry is, the different kinds of different forms of poetry, different themes of poetry, and the evolution of poetry from Elizabethan or even before that to modern times. Different kinds of samples they would have discussed. Uh, when you read more books, you understand more uh, perspectives on poetry. As a student of English literature, you can understand the nuances of poetry. If you want to write poems, you can understand the tradition um, of poetry, British poetry, American poetry, or Indian poetry. You, you can, you can uh, if you have that copy of not an anthology of poetry, which is the textbook that we have for this course, you can uh, have an idea of poets from various uh, parts of the world. So it is up to you to choose and read as many poems as you like. But for the course, if you read the poems that we have discussed, you would uh, you can easily sail through this course. What is important is understanding the nuances, understanding the poets, poems, forms, themes, poetic conventions, uh, poetic devices. In every poem, we have some kind of poetic device. That's why poetry is poetry because it uses some rhetorical or figurative language. Uh, the basic difference between connotative language and uh, denotative language we have to understand of the major uh, uh, practical devices, you will find that metaphor, simile, irony, paradox, oxymoron, and all those uh, associated devices 
uh, will come into picture. Uh, these are used by poets to express their uh, thoughts and ideas very well, effectively. In some cases, some poets may not really uh, think that they are using certain devices, but then you will see that uh, similes will automatically come, come to their help to express their thoughts. And uh, the originality of your poet lies in inventing new images. That's why analyzing images in poetry is interesting or useful for us. That's, that's how uh, they will also, poets will also contribute to uh, rejuvenating the language. That is uh, making the language new all the time, new expressions, new ideas. Otherwise, if we use the same old expressions, then the language may die. We may use cliches that may not, these may not have much effect in communication or they may lose their communicative power. So from here, we move on to our evaluation pattern. Uh, you, by now you are familiar with the quizzes that you have taken. Uh, I hope all of you have got a good um, um, scores in your um, uh, quizzes. I, I hope you didn't have much difficulty because you have the videos and also the reading script you have. All the uh, transcripts are available to you. So you could have read them and given the answers uh, exactly. And uh, maybe one or two cases you had some difficulty, but when you, you go back to your text, you would understand uh, all of them better. Apart from these quizzes, we also have in semester examination that is where one student had asked a question whether the exam will be in objective type or descriptive type. In our case, we have chosen to have both descriptive type and objective type. Uh, objective type, we have, um, I mean, um, uh, just, uh, I mean, majority of the questions will be in objective type. Only some portion will be in descriptive type because uh, after reading poems, one of the skills that we have to learn is how to analyze poems. So for that, we have uh, one section, critical appreciation at the end of the model question paper. I'm sure all of you have seen the model question paper given uh, on the portal. And if you have not seen uh, the model question paper, please look at it again and help yourself. So totally we'll have 44 questions. The first section will have 10 questions. It will have a true for a true false structure. So you have to identify whether your quest, whether the given statement is true or false. And the second section will have MCQs, that is multiple choice questions. That means you will have only one correct answer. You have to choose some answers will be there, some six options will be there. These are options in the case of MCQ and MSQ, minimum six options will be there. In the case of MCQ, you have to choose only one option. But in the case of MSQ, uh, that is uh, in the second section, we have 15 questions. In the same way, uh, in the third section, we have 15 questions. That is where we have multiple sequence, uh, multiple selection questions. That means you have to select more than one answer. Normally, it will be two, minimum two will be there. But it, in some cases, it can be four also. So you have to decide. Uh, whether the question requires you to choose two answers correct or four answers correct, correct that depends on your understanding of the subject and also understanding of the question. But uh, only one thing that I can tell you very clearly is don't be anxious, don't be nervous on seeing the question. Uh, whatever knowledge you have, use that knowledge well to your own advantage. Uh, scholarship ultimately uh, depends on how well you are able to project the knowledge that you have not show your ignorance. That, that's where we get more anxious or nervous. And lastly, we have four questions. We have four passages, short poems, usually some sonnets or some extracts, more, not more than 10 or 12 lines. In the case of sonnets, you may have 14 lines, but I have tried to give less number of lines for you so that you can see all the, four, uh, all the 10 lines or 12 lines on the same page. You should be able to read and also type I know the difficulty in uh, answering questions online. You have to type the answer, the paragraph answer you have to type. And for that also, I have given some guidelines how to answer the um, uh, descriptive answer. Uh, how do you do that uh, appreciation? 
briefly write about if you are able to understand the poem, the poet, the theme, briefly write one or two sentences of introduction and then identify the thematic contrast. In all the poems that you have studied, you will find that there is one slide called thematic contrast. So uh, life and death or um, love and death, love and hatred, day and night, these are some of the common uh, recurrent uh, contrast or binaries, uh, if you want to call it. So uh, some kind of binary will always be there because when we speak about one, see, as I was telling about knowledge, I mentioned ignorance. So you can't help, uh, we always think in, uh, in terms of binaries, you can't help it. So uh, identify the thematic contrast and see which side the poet focuses on. And uh, the poet, he or she, may try to give you some understanding of what love is. At the same time, he would also uh, give you uh, a different aspect of uh, love in through the idea of uh, death or hatred or something like that. That's the first thing you have to do. When you read the poem, identify the thematic, at least a handful, um, a couple of uh, um, uh, contrasts you should be able to identify. That, that's where you will understand the theme of the poem much, be much better. Then you have to identify the poetic devices. Metaphor, simile, axiomoron, or uh, uh, pun or paradox, um, irony, uh, epigram, polysyndetin, um, asyndetin, anaphora, antistrophe. Uh, these are some of the devices which we have a very often identified personification, uh, transferred epithet. It, it will vary from poem to poem. You may not find all these devices in all poems. Just uh, one or two will be there. But when it comes to uh, some sound patterns like alliteration, assonance, consonance, uh, repetition of words, rhyme, uh, and all that, uh, that, in the, that part will come next. So poetic devices, you have to identify. And if these poetic devices have some significance or uh, uh, in relation to the theme, please highlight why does the poet use one particular image in this context, either through metaphor or through simile or personification or the opposite of personification like reification, when there is a kind of depersonalized image, as it happens in the case of Pope's poetry, where he uses animal imagery to refer to human beings, why does uh, Pope call Lord Harvey uh, as the curd of asses milk? So when that's how he expresses his anger, dislike, uh, 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 revulsion against uh, such uh, <coughs> enemies of Pope and the even Dryden. So try to connect the device with the theme of the poem. Then uh, next part is rhyme. Identify. Try to identify the rhyme. If there is no rhyme, doesn't matter. But normally we use this A B C D format. A, B, A, B, or A, A, uh, B, B, depending on the words of which rhyme at the end. So when we say rhyme, we usually refer to end rhyme. Sometimes we can have internal rhyme as well. If you are able to identify the kinds of rhyme like masculine rhyme or feminine rhyme or full rhyme or part rhyme, that is where uh, you will have more knowledge about poetry. If you are uh, able to do it, do well. Uh, or otherwise, at least identify some rhyme. When you have more rhyme like this, then two words at the end of every um, at the end of um, lines, when two lines rhyme with each other, then you will have something known as couplet. So uh, when you have more and more couplets like this, you will come to heroic couplet. In the case of uh, sonnets, usually in the Shakespearean sonnet, the last two lines will uh, rhyme, and so they will make a couplet. But when you come to to his high mistress. There are 46 lines and all these 46 lines have 23 uh, rhymes or they are 23 couplets. And when you come to uh, Mac Placno or um, uh, Pope's episode to Dr. Abhatnath, you find that all the lines um, are rhymed. So that uh, 419 lines are there in episode to Dr. Abhatnath and only one uh, passage is in triplet. So how do you account for that uh, odd number? So uh, uh, Pope uses a triplet and then when you count the total, it will be 419. And um, why does he reserve or use that uh, triplet separately in this context to attack uh, Lord Harvey 
with a special device called triplet it does that in the case of um, macflex no you may have more than one triplet uh, to uh, poets particular neoclassical poets use such triplets to um, reduce monotony in reading poetry and uh, also to achieve some uh, rhetorical effect on the audience then rhythm remember iambic pentameter i am iambic trochaic spond spondy apric dactyl um, anapest and all that you would have come across in our course and i am, that is uh, these terms refer to the rhythm of um, uh, the poems and then meter monometer trimeter uh, dimeter trimeter tetrameter pentameter hexameter all that you would have seen so um, normally in english poetry we have iambic pentameter normally but in many cases you will not have uh, uh, iambic pentameter you may have tetrameter in the whole poem of andrew uh, marvel's uh, poem uh, to his coy mistress he is in uh, tetrameter so why does he Uh, he used tetrameter. You can ask a question like this, and then understand that he deals with the fast passage of time. A uh, time flies fast, so he wants the lady to yield to him so that they can live together happily for some time before they die. Uh, and so he uses tetrameter. And he used pentameter. That is a normal uh, speech pattern, normal speed of speech in English poetry. But when you go beyond this pentameter. say for example hexameter then you reduce the uh, movement a uh, little more that is you slow the speed of poetry why do you, why do you do that uh, maybe um, the poet has some kind of belief that he can control the passage of time or he has some uh, heavy heart when the poet is sad you will normally you can see when we are uh, uh, walking fast we are cheerful and happy when we walk slowly the we are melancholic so some kind of uh, similar uh, tendency you can find in poetry as well so what is that uh, meter you have to identify and then finally you have to give overall impression what does a poem try to do if you if you can understand the name of the poet do it and usually i have taken the poems from the course uh, text only um so most of the uh, poems these are not um, unknown poems even if you have one unknown poem or unfamiliar poem doesn't matter try to um, understand um, the poem analyze the poem with the knowledge that you have gained from this course and one or two lines of conclusion if you are able to write then you would have done your end semester very well so now let me pause and then uh, take questions i will not be able to see the screen so uh, if you can type your questions maybe i can see through chat otherwise you can speak actually you can do that anyone willing to ask questions or give your impressions what is that you have learned from this course you are welcome Hello, Ashwini. Yes, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, do you have yeah. some questions, or you are yes, you can sir. carry your thoughts? Yes. Uh, you know, the most of the poem we are dealing with in this course, it is all, uh, you know, it comes, uh, period wise, right? So we offer historic historical context is very uh important for all this poem. Yes. Uh, what can we do without historical context? Sir, is there any kind of reading possible without historical context? Uh, in where when you have the opportunity of referring to the historical context, you can do it. But in the examination, um, when you you may not be able to remember the entire history, right? Are you referring to the examination context or general? No, sir, sir. No, no, not from the examination point of view. Okay. In general. Um, uh, you know you you must be familiar with close reading new critical reading are you familiar yes. rashmini yes yes sir yes sir so at the time uh, new critical uh, analysis was in the early 20th century new critical analysis was undertaken uh, primarily because when we know the poet when we know the context we go with a prejudiced view 
then we know that yeah. one this is an indian poem we rate it uh, lower than uh, an uh, an american poem or a british poem do you understand so if we have uh, advantages and disadvantages so uh, depending on our uh, critical aim what is that we want to do as much as possible if you know it is good but uh, how do you use that knowledge historical knowledge uh, that is also we have to uh, consider yes is that sir right? yes yeah yeah somebody can use the knowledge or abuse the knowledge right true 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 sir yeah that's a good question fair use of knowledge if you can do that that's fine all right all right sir thank you thank you in uh, our and, course in our course we have you would have seen we have given historical context and literary context for every point that yes, we have yes, every poem that yes, we have done yes some yes. Of knowledge okay okay so then i have one more question also uh, hmm. you know uh, in this contemporary time uh, what kind of research are taking place in poetry especially in Brit british poetry in uh, british poetry uh, you must understand that uh, um, it's it's actually a good question again uh, after uh, american poetry became dominant british poetry lost its significance uh, british poets in the 1960s and 70s i refer to one liverpool poets remember uh, or nowadays um, if you come to uh, Uh, late uh, 20th century or early 21st century you will find that british poetry is dominated by immigrants you can't believe that our own um, indian poets have settled in um, uh, uk and they are winning the prizes there and um, and also i found uh, to my surprise that a lot of women poets are there in uk and europe today they are dominating the field so naturally the questions of uh, women uh, perspectives are very dominant in uh, poetry research in uh, contemporary british literature thank you sir thank you so much uh, that is really interesting actually lot of women poets are there more um, uh, women poets are there yes any other question any other generally what do you feel about the course what what are you doing and uh, why did you join this course sir actually i took your uh, literature and life course the last time so i have okay. joined poetry this time okay good 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 i hope you learned something from literature and life yeah yeah and i am expecting uh, part 2 from you sir Oh, for maybe the... literature and philosophy too uh, you can go for that <laughs> literature not literature and philosophy literature and social justice like that i have some idea or uh, literature and values something like that yes sir yes sir actually we need this kind of course for this time sir that's what thank i can say you. thank you uh is uh only one i found only one question in the link that was sent to us uh, by npital and so i do not uh, that have, i have answered that is uh, the question paper will have both uh, objective type and uh, descriptive type questions descriptive type how to answer these questions i have explained let me see in the chat is there anybody else in there no okay if you have any other questions comments you can have uh, otherwise we can wind up our session ashni uh, is there any i don't see anybody is there any anybody else vijay baskar no you can't speak well okay i see only uh, let me see uh, yeah there is nobody else so we can okay okay vijay baskar you need not attempt to speak it's okay then we will uh, close our session
Thank you, sir. Ah, pala pa. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir.